And thank you for joining us at this uh, Knowledge Equity Network event. Today's event is going to focus on reward and recognition, building a culture of collaborative leadership. I'm really pleased to be able to welcome our three speakers, Simone boyton Dyke, who's our Vice Chancellor and President at the University of Leeds, Josephine Shulton, who's the Regional Managing Partner for Europe of Perrot Lever, and Kurt Rice, who's pre Professor and former President of the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and previous President of the o Oslo Metropolitan University. The question and answer function is live, so please do add any questions here and we'll pick these up in the Q&A section towards the end of the event and I will invite our speakers to answer these. To start with, I'd like to firstly introduce and welcome Simone to speak first. Thank you, Helen, and, and thanks also to Kurt and Josephine to be joining me today uh, in this, this wonderful opportunity to discuss the really important topic of collaboration um, in higher education. Um, and I know we have a very exciting list of participants. I hope you'll all join us with, with questions and we'll be able to get to most of them, of course. This is going to be recorded, so you can always look it back on YouTube. Um, so let's, let's get started here. Um, and clearly the topic is very key to what the Knowledge Equity Network is about, which has many goals. But for me, the, the most important ones really are uh, to create globally equitable access to knowledge, which is something we really don't have at the moment. And I think it's very close to the human right to knowledge, which actually is in the UN Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, the right to knowledge. And that's something that we are often not aware enough. And clearly, access to knowledge is not equitably distributed across the planet. It's very different for people living in the global south compared to the global north, but also within countries, within regions, within cities, not every citizen, not every member of our global population has the right to knowledge, which will help them succeed in life, have a, a healthy life, be able to contribute to society. And it's really important for, for our planet that every member of our global population has that equitable right to knowledge. Um, so how do we do that? And, and it's, it's very closely related to a third goal of CAN, and that's a change in culture in higher education, culture of research, but also culture of teaching, and also the culture of how to create maximum societal impact, because of course those are the three core missions of universities, research, education, and societal impact. And for me, societal impact at some point, hopefully, will just sink into research and education. I think at the moment, it's really important that it's a separate core mission because we have a tendency to forget it a little bit. We know it's there, but somehow on any given day in higher education leadership, it seems less important than research and education. And if we don't do research and education for societal impact, I think we're making a grave mistake. So can hopefully will speed up that recognition of societal impact being the most important thing. And that brings me to the why question that I think we should all keep asking ourselves in higher education leadership. Why are we in our jobs? What makes us get up in the morning, as they say? And why are universities on this planet? And I think the most important answer at the moment is because we really can make a huge change. And we all know our planet faces enormous challenges uh, in equities being uh, basically at the sort of running through all the global challenges. Um, and I think universities are the only networked institutions that if they truly work together can make a huge dent in all the global challenges. But the problem at the moment is that we don't think enough about working together, especially globally. We're still so much in that mode of feeling that competition actually drives excellence. It's fascinating how universities who should be working, thinking, acting in a very evidence-based way still seem to embrace this Darwinian concept of, of competition leading to excellence. And there's very little evidence for it. Actually, most modern evolutionary biologists know that the big advances in in the survival of species, in the thriving of species, uh, including humans, um, don't come from competition, but come from relentless collaboration. And when you look at the world 
in a different way, through a different lens, you'll recognize that it's really collaboration that drives the thriving and the prosperity and the health and the well-being, not just of humans, but of, of all the species on our planet and actually of plants and every, all the living, living beings on our, on our planet. So why universities don't use that more um, is, I think, the, the big question. And I think it's really not that hard to start being more collaborative, but it's something we need to purposefully think about. And we need to be very, very um, focused on how to do that because the barriers to it are huge because of our ingrained ways of being and the fact that for so long, we've embraced this idea that competition leads to excellence. And of course, it's not just in higher education, it's everywhere. It starts in primary education, secondary education, it's in society around us. But universities need to lead, they can't follow and then use the fact that they're following as an excuse for their non-evidence-based behaviors. So for me, Ken and, and um, a growing group of universities and funders and recruiters that we have one off today, and lots of other individuals who embrace this notion really is a movement that can truly make a huge difference. So I'm very excited about it and I'm excited about these separate sessions where we zoom in more on particular topics. And I think we have two amazing speakers who come at it from completely different angles, but it's very complementary and probably even synergistic. So Josephine, I think it's the first time, uh, is from uh, Parrot Lever, a major recruiting agency. And I don't think we've ever had the perspective of a recruiter in these meetings. And it's so important because recruiters, if they do their jobs well, and I know Josephine does an excellent job, actually really determine what kind of people make progress in universities, what people get appointed to leadership roles, which young um, colleagues get, get pushed through the pipeline to become the leaders of tomorrow. But they need to work with university leaders. So when they embrace this whole notion, which I know Josephine does, and she'll talk about it in a little bit, they also need the help and the insight from university leaders. And then clearly um, uh, recruiters together with people in powerful positions in higher education can make a huge difference in the career paths and, and in what we reward, what we recognize, what the incentives are. Because I'm a firm believer in the human propensity for collaboration. So I think if we remove the barriers to collaboration, people will do it because it actually makes us so much happier. But we need to remove those barriers. And because there's so many, it's a very concerted effort. So the radical collaboration also needs to come in in the collaborations that we have with recruiting companies such as Barrett Labor. And then Kurt Rice will talk about open science, which sounds like a completely different topic, but of course it's very much related. Because also in open access to science and open access publishing and thinking about who we're creating knowledge for, we need to think about what behaviors we reward, how we make sure that individuals don't just go for their own CV in terms of what kind of outputs they produce, but actually really think about how they can maximally help um, the global challenges and, and make them uh, get less um, big than they are at the moment. But for that too, we need to make sure we have the reward, the recognition, the incentives. And our early career researchers will often say, it's all great, this narrative CV business and all these other ways of actually producing um, papers and, and, and making my our CV valuable. But I'm also going to be employable at another university that may not embrace those principles like my present university does. To so open science careers and how do we promote um, researchers and promote behaviors, I think are very intimately linked to the whole Ken focus and to what Josephine is going to be talking about. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session. I'll stop talking now and give these two experts the, an opportunity to share their thoughts and then hopefully there's plenty of time uh, at the, in the second half of this hour um, for your questions and for hopefully our, our, our wise answers to those questions. But this is very much uh, a collaborative effort and don't feel like everything needs to be asked and answered in this one hour. And Ken is growing and will continue hopefully. So there will be plenty more opportunity for, for us to work together towards a better world. So thank you very much for joining us and let me now hand over to Josephine. 
I think you have um, a few PowerPoints um, to share with us and of course your thoughts. So please go ahead, Josephine. You're on mute. I said, let me first try and unmute myself. It's a challenge and then I will share screen. Thank you for your kind words, Simone. Um, and give me a second to make this um, PowerPoint presentation work. Um, I think it does. And then maybe we can make this a slideshow. Slideshow and why not from the beginning? Um, this is not from the beginning. How does that work? Previous, 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 previous. Uh, briefly about, I think myself maybe to introduce myself. As I said, I'm the regional managing partner for Europe. I work a lot in higher education, uh, also in arts and culture. Um, and I am um, always proud to be able to advise on senior leadership appointments. I think Simone mentioned we're, we're very, very important in who is taking those important positions. I don't think, you know, I think a bit of modesty is in, 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 um, should, be, should be mentioned because we do advise, of course, and we do not really um, take any kind of decisions. But we do try to help both the panels who have to make those decisions, but also the candidates to, to be in the good position uh, to find the um, appropriate leadership positions. So just about Parrot Lever, you might all know us. I have no idea if you've ever been engaging with us. If not yet, feel free to call me anytime. I'm very interested in, in talent and helping talent. Um, we're probably the, you know, we're in the top three of, of executive search firm who are working for for mission driven organizations i think that is and probably the only one who is employee owned so um and it's it's not about us this time but just to give you a bit of an idea uh, that we work all around the globe um and for a lot of universities um we have helped them create good leadership teams. So today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about things that Simone also mentioned, the, the, the issues that are facing the higher education sector. I will say something about collaboration and competition as well. Um, the contribution that leadership can bring to the knowledge equity and what I think is contemporary leadership and what kind of requirements we see and how to get there. So I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. It's about six, seven sheets. So I hope you bear with me for that. Uh, I think Simone already mentioned, so I, we can be a bit, bit short here, but I think societies are looking for universities to, to operate in the way that the public good benefits and I personally believe that we have been doing so. We, I say we, I used to work with the university so much. I think it became a we, uh, but I do think they, they do so for hundreds of years. Uh, but what we see is that there is so much more unrest and so much more challenges at a global scale, whether that is climate or healthcare, or in more general, the inequality of, of wealth and prosperity. Um, not to mention geopolitical tensions um, that we're in the midst of. So I think uh, societies are very much aware of the incredible challenges that they face. And then it would be easy to say that should be a golden age for universities because they have the potential to be part of the solution to help in the advancement and the sustainability of society and actually come with meaningful responses. Um, I'm not sure we are there yet because what we see is, and again, Simone mentioned it um, rightfully so, it is a big struggle to find the right model for universities to, to, to you know, find their bases on. So what we see and, and my familiarity with the Dutch system is of course much bigger than, than many other systems, but I think in general, we saw that 
policies, regulation, funding, they've all been driven by the principles of competition. And that competition would drive excellence and definitely not collaboration. And what we've seen is that the effect in short term uh, has led to short term mindsets, that it led to a lot of focus on individual, in this case, institutional growth or institutional branding and award winning research that led to higher rankings and better reputations. Um, and that is not the basis of good collaboration. So to be a bit more optimistic, what we have seen from, from our perspective is that we also see that there is not only more opportunities, but also more awareness of the importance of a more collective approach. Um, and what we see is that that universities also in on a national scale tend to look at the landscape rather than just the individual. And they find ways to come together and, and look through the lens of the big challenges and actually collaborate on those um, instead of just trying to grow their own research and their own educational programs. Um, I've seen that there's more sensitivity to come with a collective voice towards society and to show that universities are there to actually be part of the solution and to be able to deliver for the social and economic good. Um, we also see a tendency which is I think still a bit fragile but definitely maybe as an answer to the over-regulation that we've seen coming from the government that there's a more um, that there is more appetite for self-regulation and again collaboration. And we also, last but not least, see definitely a different tone in the kind of leadership that promotes the things that I've just mentioned. So when I think of leadership and what that can contribute to knowledge equity, and I will not go into the concept, I think Simone has done that um, very well. I think what what we have to realize is that to get to that fair and equitable sharing information um, on a global scale, we need leadership that is aware of and embraces that concept that, that can lead the cultural transformation, that, can, that understands the importance of nurturing emerging leaders and, and talent, that understand the, the need to allocate resources towards collaborative initiatives and not the opposite and that can ad ad help adapt policies and help adv with advocacy to the governments to support more collaborative models. Um, if we then look at again from a recruiter's perspective how we look at leaders for universities at the moment and where we try and assess their uh, qualifications, but also their suitability to take that next step. We look at their ability to embrace that collectivism and to understand that they, they are there to serve and that they embrace the concept of universities to contribute. Um, we look for people who are really connected into communities together with other age, uh, higher education institutions, but also um, with the government, with industry partners, with partners in arts and culture, really on a national and globally and, and, and an international um, level. We always, and of course, look for evidence of people who have a participatory collaborative team-based leadership style which means that they can bring and but also develop and work on a collective vision that they empower people to to take responsibility and that they are aiming to distribute power and decision making people who are have a tolerance level for making mistakes and really um, stimulate people for fast failure procedures to learn and, and people who have the ability to, you know, to be conflict resolving and to also help others take that approach. Um, to continue on these requirements, and I know it's quite a, quite a long list, but um, I think what we look for is people who have these skills to 
engage in articulating the mission for internal and external st stakeholders. So, and it was mentioned before, uh, all these stakeholders have kind of expectations. And I think the building a community with students and staff, uh, understanding that universities are a key driver of social mobility, um, explaining that universities are there to bring good for the national economic and social development. I think all these things are, are and to be able to communicate that are extremely important. Um, so again, uh, and 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 the, the communication skills, I think are key, but also to be able to navigate in a context, a context of cultural conflicts and debates in society, as we see them all the time on a day to day business, uh, which is extremely hard. And it takes, I think, a strong set of personal values. It takes personal courage. And it takes the ability to know when to speak loud and, and maybe when not to speak at all and let other people speak and listen. Um, and I realize, and we do this all day, it is really difficult to assess all these quali quali qualifications and qualities in candidates and potential candidates. But we have the, I think, the, the obligation to, to work on that and make that uh, on a professional level stronger so we can be the good advisors that universities need. So how to get there? And I'm, I'm you know, at the end of my, my speech, but I just wanted to say it is really important that we acknowledge that these leadership profiles have changed. And it is my daily job to influence and talk to panels in universities and to help them act upon that. And of course, we have to understand that, and, and we have to understand as, as recruiters, that we have to assess against the real keys for success and not just a list of requirements uh, that people know their IT and people know um, their ranking and know their individual uh, reputation um, efforts. It's it's more about, uh, well, all the things I just mentioned. So, uh, of course, it is very important to have a professional and constructive onboarding of leaders where actually not only the executive team, but everybody is involved. And last but not least, and that is also, you know, to the audience, we need appetite for leadership. So we sometimes see that there is, and I realize personally it's a it's a it can be a scary job and it's it's a, a challenging job but we need candidates and we want all of you to reflect on the fact that you sometimes have a biased view on what leadership looks like and especially female candidates seem to think it's not me um, but you have to really reassess what leadership looks like understand what your transferable skills are and what you can bring and, and on the way up to leadership roles, you know, make sure you diversify your experiences and engage with a wider challenge. Well, that was it for me um, so far. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you so much for that, Josephine. It's really appreciated. Um, just before I introduce Kurt, I just want to make a reminder that the Q&A is open and that the, those questions are going to allow the panellists to be able to continue the conversation after Kurt's spoken, so please put questions in there. Um, I'd like to invite Kurt. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Josefina, for that uh, really uh, stimulating set of thoughts about about leadership and about higher education. And I think that um, one of the core messages of the Ken Declaration, the Knowledge uh, Equity Declar Network Declaration, is just that, the role of leadership in making these kinds of changes. And in that context, uh, I think it's important also to uh, praise Simone Bautendijk's uh, vision, not only for getting the Ken Network uh, kicked off, but also for the way in which these values pervade the new strategy of the University of Leeds. <clears throat> and I think it's uh, exciting to see an institution where, uh, you know, a board really takes the risk of leaving behind those kind of macho values that we're talking about and, and embraces tomorrow's approach to leadership. I think that's going to be a great thing uh, for the institution. So congratulations to all of you who are on board with that.
As I see it, part of the <clears throat> argument for collaboration and uh, cooperation is that um, uh, it is actually better for education and it's better for science. And I'd like to spend a few minutes reflecting on that in the context of our system for scientific or academic publishing. So we have this system where, um, whereby at some point along the way, we got excited about the competition of getting published. And in fact, as researchers, but also as institutions, we got into our heads the idea that getting your paper into a journal that's somehow harder to get into means it's a better paper. And that has come to define massive uh, amounts of evaluation in our sector. It's related to hiring, it's related to promotion, it's related to getting external grants, it's related to uh, getting a VC position. It's, it's just, it's really become central and I would dare to say far too central uh, in our system of evaluating each other. Journals sort of jockey for prestige and they even become proud of their rates of rejection. The more people who try to get in but don't make the cut just shows that they're only going for the very best. But that's uh, maybe a bit, uh, a bit self-serving, that kind of evaluation. In fact, getting into those most competitive journals is related uh, to far more than the quality of the research that you do. To take one very simple point, it's related to the mastery of English that you have in your uh, research group. Papers that come in written in non-native English are sent right back. It's related to the reputation of the lab that your work comes from. And, and so, so getting into really good journals is actually related to socioeconomic factors, it's related to networks, and it's a perfect example of the kind of competitiveness or a domain in which competitiveness is driving science. It's based on prestige that we have just given away, among others, to big commercial publishers. So there are a few things that are important to think about this in the context of the Ken Declaration. For example, speed of publication actually is really important. It's important that new discoveries are communicated to the international research community as effectively as possible to keep the wheels of discovery turning. So it gets slowed down in various ways. It gets slowed down because scientists start by sending their paper to the most prestigious journal they can think of and they get a rejection. So they send it to the next journal and they get a rejection and maybe they send it to three or four or five or six journals before it gets accepted, which means that instead of using the time of one editor, it uses the time of five editors. And instead of using the time of three reviewers, it uses the time of 15 reviewers. And it uh, makes the whole process extremely laborious. So sometimes you see in journals the date of submission and the date of publication and a year or two has passed, but what happened before that submission? Maybe it's been around the block several times. So this is really uh, a system, among other things, I think based on the scarcity of paper and with uh, the conversion to internet publication more than 20 years ago, you would think that some of this has changed. Another uh, really interesting uh, issue to reflect on in this context of the traditional publishing system is that those journals that have the highest so-called impact factors, which is one kind of measure of prestige, those also have the highest rates of retraction. They're publishing a greater percentage of work that subsequently has to be retracted. Why is that? It's because they bet on potential impact that leads them to risk-taking. Now, what could be a more competition-oriented value or practice than just this kind of uh, risk-taking? And the really crazy thing is that this affects the kind of science that gets done. 
So we choose projects that are more likely to get results that can be published in a journal like that because we know what that means for our uh, careers. So the extremely important work of trying to replicate findings doesn't get done because it doesn't get published in those kinds of journals. So we've got a really crazy system that we've put together over the last 50 years and it needs to be dissembled. What we actually want to see as an example of, of uh, or seeing this as, a, as an example of the competitiveness that um, permeates the culture of science and universities, and in fact affects choices, as I said, about what kind of science gets done, what we would uh, like to do is identify an alternative. And there's a massive uh, movement underway to try to identify that alternative. And it's the open science movement of which open access publishing uh, is one part. At the heart of this movement is really um, a reclaiming of the ownership of our work from commercial interests that have that have taken it over or had it given uh, to them. So in the context of open access publishing, the model that we're trying to develop these days is called diamond open access publishing. They used to talk about green and gold and hybrid. And diamond open access publishing, that's an approach in which neither the reader nor the researcher pays to have their work uh, published. It's sponsored by uh, universities and, and, and scientific societies that own those journals. But that makes it sound like a, like a business model. And really, diamond, the diamond approach to publishing isn't, isn't so much a business model as it is a set of values. It's a value, set of values about uh, um, community-driven um, collaboration in the distribution and the quality control of our work. It's a, it's a set of values about um, academic work, including publication, which should be then led and owned by academics. This is completely compatible with the Ken Declaration. In fact, there's just tremendous overlap between the section of the Ken, Ken Declaration that talks about publishing and um, the, the Diamond Open Access Movement, which is supported by the EU, by the, by the National Institute of Health in North America, in the United States, and by many, many other uh, national and international organizations. So we need to organize ourselves uh, to make this happen. We need to create a kind of uh, you know, decentralized federation of resources and platforms and, and models. And we have to importantly build a culture uh, for um, not only creating diamond publishing outlets, but for getting our scientists to prioritize them and for rewarding contributions uh, to their growth. Perhaps the most invisible kind of work that a researcher does is the peer review of articles. There's an idea that it should be secret who has done the reviewing. So uh, the reviewer's name certainly isn't on the article and maybe doesn't even appear at any point anywhere in the journal. <clears throat> and I don't know that we have to pay people to do peer reviews, but we need to make reviewing open and transparent and rewarded, which may mean as little as acknowledged. We have to get there by having leadership at universities who understand the value of collaboration, who understand that this is not just a business uh, transition, but it's really a values-based uh, transition. And I think that, um, that uh, the assertion that scholarly results and publications are a public good is exactly the kind of perspective that's at the heart of uh, not only uh, Ken and the declaration for Ken, but at the heart of many large international um, urges that are expressed in various ways 
where Ken has a genuine opportunity to really be uh, in a leadership position and to, to make these kinds of developments uh, more important. So thank you for your attention on that, and I look forward to discussing these uh, issues with you in the coming uh, half hour. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, we've got a number of questions that have come in, so which I'm going to start fielding in just a second. Um, we welcome more questions. I just want to say at this point, if we don't get through all the questions today, the Knowledge Equity Network team are like have plans in place to follow up. So anything that gets asked, there will be space to be able to reflect on. And just to note that we've um, we're also dealing with the fact that Josephine appears to be having some technical issues and is temporarily not with us. So uh, we'll just keep going, and hopefully she's going to be able to join us soon. I want to start by bringing together two questions that we've had come into the chat, both of which relate to the idea of uh, what might be driving competition and then potentially driving collaboration. So the first one is if excellence currently drives competition and the rewards and the recognition and criteria support this, what will the criteria be that would drive collaboration? But then there's a similar question, so I'm offering you both, so maybe to speak to both of these, which is shouldn't we challenge the concept of excellence so rather than put it in opposition to collaboration isn't there an argument for saying join the conversation around excellence but in a view to redefine that so Simone would you like to speak to that first and then I'll invite Kurt yeah it almost sounds like the second question would would have been the answer my answer to the first question um, because I think this this seeming contradiction between um competition and excellence and it sometimes also is a competition between seeming competition diversity and equity and excellence like we have yeah, a we need excellence and if we start changing our career paths or reward and recognition we need to preserve excellence and i, I think people are afraid of losing excellence um, because we haven't really thought about what we mean by excellence and our present definition, uh, which has become very clear from both Josephine's talk and Kurt's talk of excellence, is incredibly narrow and, and almost like a, like a cartoon version of what we all know excellence really is about. And if we go back to the why question of why universities are on this planet, it's not to publish as many papers as possible in really high impact journals so you can feel good about yourself as a researcher and make it up the ladder to the most prestigious university you could probably land yourself a job at in your career that's not why universities are on this planet so what we need to do is find find different ways to assess find different ways to incentivize find different ways to nurture those different behaviors that we want to see and actually one of the managing partners at Parrot Laver in England, um, um, Laver himself, or yeah, it was, it was Simon, no, it was Simon Laver, yeah, Simon Laver. Um, he said to me that, that he works a lot with higher education institutions like Josephine does. And he said what he often misses in universities right now is the sense of generosity. And I think that's what we need to find, a way to assess true generosity, which also makes us more happy as individuals. So it's really, it's not a burden for early career researchers to get uh, measured by their generosity, by their empathy, by their values, by their innate drive to help change society. I think we often put lots of things in the way of early career researchers wish to make a really meaningful contribution we keep telling them yes 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 of course you know we understand you want to be societally engaged and maybe you even want to use your own lived experiences and your own background and the community you come from but most important is that you bring in the funding and you publish in these really high impact journals so people feel very frustrated that they cannot actually follow their hearts because they need to do things to build a proper academic career and that's where we go wrong so if we redefine excellence and make excellence also reflected in everything a lot of our early career researchers want to do instinctively and and from their own hearts then i think there is no problem there's no dichotomy there's no contradiction between excellence and new ways of rewarding and recognizing and the whole idea that competition drives excellence it's absolutely bonkers i'm watching an interesting new netflix program called um, life on our planet 
and I was getting so angry. I've just watched one of the 10 episodes. It's narrated by Morgan Freeman and it goes back in time, billions and millions of years. And of course, it's all animated because we weren't there and there weren't any cameras. But it talks about dynasties and wars and survival and extinction and fighting. And it's full of growling animals who just try to kill each other. And, it, and some of the premises literally are without competition, no evolution. And I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is crazy and we're all embracing it, even in academia. And that Steven Spielberg thinks that, okay, fine. And that Morgan Freeman can narrate that in a really serious voice with ominous music at the bottom, that's all okay. But, but we really should not get into that mindset in academia and we really are all the time we still think that if we're not highly competitive we won't be excellent so sorry this is a bit of a rant but it's very close to my heart thank you for giving me an opportunity so it really is about redefining excellence not letting go of excellence just looking at it differently if i could um maybe i'll just supplement um a little bit and uh, what simona said um Part of what should drive collaboration, um, I think, and, and which we in leadership, those of us in leadership positions have to find better ways to reward is that the scientific questions that we're facing today require large scale collaboration in order to get to the answers that we're, that we're in order to answer the questions that we're um, pursuing. So, um, um, many countries are talking a lot about um, food security these days. So we want to investigate questions about uh, food security. Well, understanding, figuring out issues about food security requires figuring out issues about water resources and how that's distributed. And that requires figuring out questions about um, forest management and how that is uh, carried out, which uh, in turn has implications for, you know, carbon capture ratios. And, and one thing is related to the next, it's related to the next. And if we want to really have a deep understanding of food security, just to take that as an example of a question that must be answered through very, very large scale collaboration, uh, then, um, then part of what drives a shift from competition to collaboration is the the quest for discovery, the urge to find new knowledge that um, hopefully is is what has brought researchers uh, in in into their into their profession. So there are genuine scientific motivations, and then we have to say that um, our job isn't to be better at forest management than. And then the guys down the road are at forest management. Our job is to figure out how to work together to, to um, put this in the context of much, much larger question. Thank you very much. Um, there's a set of questions that have um, come through, which are about um, recognizing different kinds of experience in relation to leadership so if we're saying maybe there's a need for a different kind of leader in the future um, some questions have come through around this um, so how might we ensure that uh, that we value and recognize leadership in professional services so maybe coming from spaces where collaboration is key and impacts often already an embedded metric but these are often seen as just admin rather than skilled areas of work so recognizing these different kinds of expertise and how might future leaders without extensive track academic track records get taken more seriously in the HE recruitment process um, and there was also another specific question, which was about advising a young female postdoc. And I just wanted to bring that out because reflecting on the fact that the context from which our early career, ac career academics and researchers are operating already makes a difference to the type of advice and the type of pathway that's in front of them as potential future leaders. So Josephine, speaking about um, how future leaders from different backgrounds might get in. Uh, um, welcome back, by the way, and fingers crossed your audio is going to work for us now. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, there, there were a lot of questions. I'm not sure where to start, but I think uh, maybe in terms of how to make sure that you know non people with a non-academic background are taken seriously 
by panels to to have leadership roles. I think we have quite we have quite positive experiences with that recently, um, being able to find people that have shown and have evidence and, and some proof of the fact that they understand the dynamics of being in an academic environment. So I think the, the, the previous generation of people who actually had quite a big interest in becoming a leader or taking up a leadership role in a, uni in a university not necessarily being qualified or having that background, we, we very often saw that people came in thinking they would fix it, you know, give me a year and I'll fix whatever is wrong because decision making takes forever and it's, you know, they talk and they don't really put things in action and they had all these preconceptions about what, you, what was wrong with universities and what I think is the positive now is that we see a new generation of potential leaders who come in and say, I understand there is, this is not to, to fix, this is to embrace, to understand, to really have a feel for that dynamic and that participatory way of working and really bottom up working because that is the core of science. So I think as soon as we have also ourselves as recruiters, but also candidates have adopted and adapted to that kind of vocabulary, I think it is easier to bridge the gap. And it's easier to understand that there's many ways of being qualified for a leadership role like that without having to have a, a, a very traditional academic career. So I think it is too easy to just look at panels and say they're old school. It is candidates themselves who have the skill and the ability to understand their own skill set and to and also recruiters who understand and can bridge in terms of vocabulary, um, how that could look like. And maybe one comment for, for any young academic who, who is, has an interest in leadership. I think the way to get there is one, be vocal about that and, and understand that leadership can appear and will appear to you in many shapes and forms. So uh, step into a role as soon as you can raise your hand, coordinate, work interdisciplinary, work together with people that are often referred to as the admin, uh, but get that different perspective on problems that might you know, appear to you as for young academics as very one-dimensional. Look for those multi-dimensional complex problems and they can be very small scale, but that complexity learns you the basics of leadership, I would say. So volunteer to do that and be curious about what others can teach you. Just one idea. And sorry for being away, uh, Kurt. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed most of your talk. Very sorry. Kurt, would you like to speak to any of the, uh, those three questions we put together about people moving into those leadership, senior leadership roles? Well, um, um, I completely agree with what uh, Josefina has said. And I would just, um, I guess, from my perspective, um, leadership in academic settings it has um, its own challenges and everybody in their own sector thinks that they have their own challenges. And, and I think that about academia also. And one of those challenges is that um, there's a certain entrepreneurial air to being a researcher. So it's, it's not um, always the case that researchers <clears throat> think that they have a, a boss. And, uh, and even if they do think that they aren't always so interested in what that boss has to, say and and that requires that people who are moving into leadership develop skills develop leadership skills and i think um maybe that's um, part of what Josephine was saying that you know raise your hand and try to learn from the people around you so so it doesn't only require uh you know being tough and being willing and able to stand in a storm but it also requires uh, having a having a toolkit that includes um, that includes being able to tackle the kind of uh, challenges that you um, that you see there, and then um, 
you know, I spend a lot of time talking about uh, gender equality uh, issues and gender balance issues and diversity. And, uh, you know, there is um, no denying that men and women are evaluated differently. Um, and uh, we can wish that we could change that system and that culture as much as we all would like to do that, but we have the culture that we have today. And um, I think it's important to um, be informed about situations where um, you're likely to be judged more harshly uh, for the same kind of behavior that a man perhaps gets uh, rewarded for, unfortunately. Thank you. Simone? Yeah, maybe to add to what, what um, uh, Josephine and Kurt were saying, I think it's very important for people in a higher leadership position in universities to know what the issues are and to, to, to really act um, to, to find a better balance and to give opportunities to take some risks with younger uh, career um, researchers or colleagues in admin roles and just go beyond the beaten path, because I think a lot of the inbuilt conservatism in universities actually comes from the very top, where the leaders themselves are afraid to make the wrong choice, whatever that is, and then keep going for things that we all feel, yeah, yeah, great, you know, we know this, this is sort of a safe pair of hands, clearly we can't go wrong. And thereby we perpetuate that same culture. And whether we know it or not, we provide a lack of opportunity. We don't give opportunities to the very people that we actually want to see more of in our organization. So to actively scout and, and invite and encourage and say, I see you, I want you in this position. And yes, maybe you don't have 10 years of experience yet, but no, yeah, okay, you're in your mid thirties, how could you? but I see something in you and I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to put you in this role, but then I'll just say, okay, fine. Now I've put you there. Now you figure it out, but make sure that actually you keep supporting and you keep helping and you keep having that, that cover that people know you have their backs. So when they bump into issues, because sometimes they don't need to line manage colleagues who are older than them, who have been in the organization for longer. So as leaders, we need to be daring. We need to be courageous. We need to take risks to help younger colleagues make it up the career ladder and bring in that different culture, different profile, different thinking into our universities. Because universities are so incredibly conservative by their nature. So you need to have a real vision, a real focus and a real willingness to go against the grain and to fight for different kinds of appointments and to use headhunters who get it, but also get your own councils, your boards on board and your senior colleagues and give people a bit of space to find out what it's like and enable, allow them to also make mistakes. Because if you're relatively new in the role and you're young, you haven't done it before, of course, you're going to make mistakes, whatever they are. So I, I think it's incumbent upon people like, like us, like me, like Kurt, like other university leaders to actually stick our necks out and say, you know, I've, I've made it up the ladder and I'm going to help others can pull them up and just just do it there's so much we could do that we're not doing so just do it would be my motto actually thank you all very much um the time has passed remarkably quickly and i now need to move us into kind of closing remarks which i'm going to do in reverse order so we're going to go kurt josephine and then simone i'm going to be quite cheeky and i'm going to ask if you could touch on some of the questions that we haven't got as you close so the two areas that i would really like to to see if we could touch on one is we've got some questions around um ken but also um wider issues around the diamond oa model so picking up on this idea that goes hey, if my job security depends on publishing in particular types of journals, how does that fit with moving to this Diamond OA model? And then the other one that um, had come up in the chat, uh, sorry, in the questions would be around, like, is, is there really space for failure and how do we achieve that sharing failure in a system where we still talk about wanting to have impact? So if we're failing, how does that fit with having impact? So if you can weave those into your closing remarks, Kurt, I'd like to invite you first. Thank you. Oh, those are really interesting questions. <clears throat> if I take the question about uh, space for failure, 
You know, um, <clears throat> failure is extremely important for researchers. <clears throat> and um, a, a kind of twisting that just slightly uh, to the context of laboratory science, um, dis discovering what isn't the solution <clears throat> is in many cases as important as discovering what is the solution. And sometimes we don't go in with a positive hypothesis about something that won't work. We go in with a positive hypothesis that something will work and then it doesn't. And that is a discovery. That is a finding. That is pushing the field forward. And it, it can be used metaphorically to talk about uh, the importance of failure in the scientific enterprise. If we're only um, talking about our successes, and uh, the, the things that don't work are going to have to be discovered over and over and over uh, again. Um, <clears throat> diamond open access journals have to be uh, robust and um, provide both the distribution and the quality of the tool that's really at the heart of the publishing uh, system. And they do, the many, many of them that, that exist today uh, do. So that, I guess, as an individual, you have to think about what it means to own your work and why you shouldn't just uh, give it away to Elsevier or Springer. But another part of my message is that this model that I sketch is the model that is coming and it will become dominant in the coming five to 10 years. And so it's, it's important that, that we all understand uh, what kind of model is about to uh, emerge and dominate so that we can interact with it uh, fruitfully when the time comes. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Um, maybe my closing comment, I would like to address some of the comments that I've read in the Q&A about the position of people in professional services. And by no means, um, it was my intention, or it should be anybody's intention to refer to those people as admin people. And I think uh, just to make not only my, my own position clear, but also to, to give you a bit of an insight in how we look at that from a recruiter's perspective, I think in professional services, per definition, we find people who have the ability to collaborate. It is in the core of their nature and in the core of their expertise to know how to use vocabulary and how to make how to get bridges and how to make sure that um, diversity in teams and in functions works to a point where we actually can have impact as an institution as a team as an organization so i think it is uh, and it is d delightful to see, and actually my, my own network in, in those circles is, is not by accident really strong because I have seen and I will see that many of these people will take leadership roles in academia in a, at a wider scale. And we have seen uh, people ending up being very valuable members of executive boards. And I think that is absolutely a very good example of how people understand complexity, how people that understand the dynamics of an academic environment, uh, talk, talk the vocabulary and also be able to lead and, and collaborate and bridge the gaps and, and have that impact. So I think there's, there's definitely um, a lot to say for people in professional services to help us change also the image of what traditional leaders would be or should be in academia. Do you want me to come in? It's, it's already one past five, so I'll, I'll be really, really quick. Uh, I think this has been a wonderful discussion and I'll just end by saying, I think we need to be courageous as leaders, as everybody engaged in this incredibly important topic. And what is better than being collectively courageous and using the power of the group um, to move forward? Um, so let's let's continue these kind of discussions. Let's continue finding each other and let's keep focusing on, on the big job ahead that we can all do, especially if we work together and if we do that in a very purposeful way. 
so maybe that's um, where, we, where we can end today. And I'm looking forward to all the next meetings that we'll have. There are many more scheduled. And I hope this too will be a growing platform in, in size and, and importance for these globally um, crucial conversations. So thanks to, to my uh, two fellow panelists and also to you, Helen, and of course, most importantly, to everybody who's been participating and hope to see you all again really, really soon. Thank you. Thank you all. And just a reminder that the next Knowledge to Equity Network is going to be taking place in two weeks time. And that's looking at rankings, interrogating the impact of knowledge, equity and openness, which is a beautiful con continuation of the conversation that we've been having here. And you can book online um, at the Knowledge Equity Network homepage. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>